Ah, it's good to be here. I'm, you know, I've been here 41 and a half years, and I still like coming. I've been here longer than most of Well, all of you except Tanya. Tanya and Jarrett's been here longer than I have. But I sure like being here, and I sure like worshiping with you. It's, you know, we're a family here. Uh, we may not know everybody, but we are family. There's some of my kin folks I know better than I do others. And I'm talking about in the natural. <laughs> some I'm glad I don't know too good. Oh, anyway, that's, that's beside the point, isn't it? Mm. All right. So let's, uh, let's I, I want to say something about the Passover Seder. You know, we, we have some people who struggle a little bit with Dale because he is so detailed and deep. And uh, this is an illustrated message. It's, it's not just teaching. It is teaching, but it's illustrated. There will be things that he holds up and says, this, they do this, and this is what this means. And it would behoove you to be here that Wednesday night. And... Uh, uh, it's a, it's a meal, but, it, but we're not eating, okay? So eat before you come. Uh, we used to do Passover meals, and uh, we just got too big and can't do that anymore. So we're just doing a ceremonial celebration. And uh, so come expecting, come to learn, bring your notebooks. Uh, there's so much that you, we, there's so much that comes to us from the Jewish culture that points to Christ. And you know what? I believe that someday they will see that and they'll want him as their Messiah. I believe that. I, I, believe, I believe that's how God hooked Paul and uh, I believe that's how he will hook the Jews in the last days. He'll show them in their, in their uh, Torah, the, the Old Testament, the Messiah because he's in there. Jesus said one time, and he wasn't talking about the New Testament because the New Testament wasn't here yet. He says, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Well, what book is he talking about? The Old Testament. So, anyway. Let's talk about Abraham. What do you think? Okay, this is our, what, third week? We got two more weeks. And we got a long way to go. So, let's, let's get started. We, you know, uh, for those of you have, that have not been here, we, uh, we began with God appearing to Abram. Uh, he, before he was Abraham, he was Abram. Abram means exalted father or father of heights. And it could be a reference to the fact that he was an idol worshiper. He did not know God. He did not know about God. And uh, he was a descendant of um, Shem, after the flood, we, you know, the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, they, the, 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 uh, they repopulated the earth, and he was a descendant of Shem. And uh, not, I mean, he was not the son, but he, that was his great, 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 great grandfather. And, uh, but he didn't know about God, and he lived in Ur of the Chaldees. And mankind from the, from the Garden of Eden, we started there talking about how man was not getting better, he was getting worse. Adam and Eve fell, and then, then their son, one son killed the other son. And then after that, men became very wicked, and God destroyed mankind. And he started again with Noah and, and uh, his three sons and uh, their wives. And Noah got drunk. And there was a whole mess, and mankind start continued in the downward spiral until they, they built the Tower of Babel, and they were going to they were going to make a monument unto themselves, and they were going to they basically were going to go right back into idol worship. That we're going to continue in idol worship, and uh, God came down and confused their languages and dispersed them, and that's how the earth was populated. People moved to different areas. And so it, was, it seems like for a couple hundred years, God was just silent. And then in chapter 12 of, of Genesis, he appeared to Abram. And he said, I want you to get out of your, I want you to leave this country. I want you to leave your father's house. 
I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your culture. I want you to leave your inheritance. I want you to leave everything and go to a place that I will show you. Didn't give him much to go on. He, did, he made him some promises. And, uh, but he didn't tell him how he was going to do it. And Abraham started off. Abram started off. And in partial obedience, he took his father with him, took his nephew Lot with him, and uh, he started the journey. And he, he was in Haran for five years until his father died, and then he came into Canaan, which would be the land that they would inherit, which is now Israel. And uh, so they came, into, they came into the land, and... Last week we talked about how they came to a place called Ai and, and then he moved eastward towards Bethel. Ai means ruin. Bethel means house of God. And it kind of depicted Abram's journey. He lived in ruin. He did not know God. He did not know about God. God revealed himself to him and brought him out of his idolatry. He brought him out of that land and he, he was bringing him uh, out of ruin. And the word Bethel means house of God. He was bringing him to the house of God. And that's the way that God works in our lives. He brings us out of our ruin. A lot of you came to Christ out of crisis. And you were ruined. Uh, and actually, if we really know it, all of us came out of crisis. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I don't care what we think. You know, we, we're idol worshipers too because sometimes we think that our own good works can get, can get us somewhere with God. That's idolatry. That's self-worship. But it can't. And so God brings us out of ruin and, and then he brings us towards his house. That's where we need to go from, from ruin to the house of God. I've had people say, I don't, I don't need the church. I don't want the church. I don't need it. Yes, you do. You do need the church. You, number one, because God said you did. And he established the church to be a refuge for, for us. We need, we need worship. We need teaching. And we need fellowship. And, and basically what God was doing is he was separating Abram from his past, he was changing his people, places, and things. You ever heard that before? And you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna flourish in the in the things of God, you have to change your people, places, and things. If you were in addiction, you have to change your people, places, and things. You can't hang out with the, the guy you bought drugs from. You can't go to the crack house. I'm sounding like Jason now. And you got to change your things. And, and so this is what God was doing in his life. He was changing his people, places, and things. So he, uh, he comes t uh, to this place, and he pitches a tent, and he builds an altar. And there he establishes a relationship with God. Uh, the tent represents sojourning. We don't belong to this world as Christians. He didn't belong, he didn't belong in Canaan. Even though his, his, uh, his offspring would inherit it, he did not have a possession in that land. He was a sojourner. And it's just like we don't have anything here that belongs to us. We're sojourners. We're passing through. And, uh, and then he built an altar where he worshiped God. And if we'll keep in mind that we don't belong in this world, that we own nothing in this world, that this world is not our, our home, and that heaven is our home, and wherever God is, is is our home, and that we worship Him, we can stay in fellowship with God. But, but you know what? When Abram left his tent and his altar, he got in trouble. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So... Uh, all of a sudden, Abram decides that he's going to move again. He's, he's pitched his tent and built an altar in between Bethel and Ai. And it says in uh, chapter 12, verse 9, it says, So Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Now some translations, and maybe your translation says the, the Negev. The Negev is a desert in southern Israel. 
why would you want to move? I mean, we, we, we went to, in 2011, we went to Israel. And we were in the northern part, and there's a place called Banis up there. And they have, they, it's the headwaters of the Jordan River. And there's, there's the springs and, and waterfalls, and we went to this waterfall. And it, it was, I mean, it was a mist blowing, and it was cool and nice, and you got wet. We were nourished, you know, our, our physical bodies. And then, you know, we, we went by the Sea of Galilee, and it was plush and fruit growing, and it was just the best place. And, but he goes, on towards, he goes on towards the Negev, which is a desert. Why did he do that? Ur was a desert. He did what he was familiar with. And a lot of times, when we come to Christ, in our journey... We gravitate what we were familiar with, okay? Especially if we don't do what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. And let's read that. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What are we supposed to do when we come to Christ? We're, we're to present our whole selves to Him. Because you know what he's going to do? He's going to change us. He takes us just like we are. He takes us where we are. But he loves us too much to live, to keep us there because we're killing ourselves. See, the lifestyle that we come out of sin with is, is still things that are in our lives that still, that still causes us destruction. We have, we have destructive, destructive thinking. We have destructive habits and God wants to change the way that we, we look. He wants us to g give the control of our bodies to Him, not to lust, not to, not to all of these other things th that's in the world, the pride of life and the, the deceitfulness of riches and lust for other things. He wants us to, to not be living that way. So we're supposed to present our bodies to Him as a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable Service and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, a metamorphosis, by the renewing of your mind. He wants us to give our, our minds, our thinking, and our thoughts to Him, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, Abraham didn't have a Bible to renew his mind with. So he, he did that which was most natural, and he he. He went down into where there was this desert. In verse 10 says, Now there was a famine in the land. Well, duh, he was in a desert. But it was, an, it was a more extreme famine in that desert. And look at this next phrase here. And Abram went down. Now he's already in the south, which depicts... Uh, a, tra a trajectory that's not, that's not a good, tra I can't say that word, trajectory. But from there he goes down. He could have gone up. He could have gone back to Bethel. He could have gone up to the Sea of Galilee. He could have gone to Banna. He could have gone there where there was supply. And we're going to find out in a little bit when they come back that there is supply there. But instead of, instead of going up, it says he went down to Egypt to dwell there. Wow. For the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass. Now, see, we all, we all come into famine sometimes in our lives. Especially when we depart from the path a little bit. It's not that we're not Christian. But we just, we just quit listening to the Lord. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there where, where you know Jesus, but you just kind of stray off? And you come into a famine? And then, then you just do worse? What do we need to do? We need to turn around and go up. But we'll get back to that in a minute because he's going to do that after a while. But something happened. 
his, his bad traits begin to come out. See, here's, here's what famine does to your life. Expo, it exposes your weaknesses. And Abram had this weakness, and we're going to see what it is. And it came to pass when they, he was close to uh, entering Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife. Now, I, I want to remind you, what did God promise Abram? He says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, he had those promises. But does he cling to those promises when he's in the famine? Okay? So he said to Sarah, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a, a woman of beautiful countenance. He, he wasn't a dumb guy, was he? <laughs> he said the right thing, and she was. Therefore, it will happen. Therefore, it will happen. Therefore, it will happen. Well, how did he know? You know, sometimes when we get into these situations, we start imagining things that are the worst. Okay? Okay? Sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't, okay? Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Now, what did God promise him? I'm going to make you a great nation. Through you, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Is he thinking about the promises of God? Is, is he in his faith right here? No, he is in something that's bad, the opposite of faith, which is called fear. Fear will cripple your faith. It will rob you. That's what it's designed to do. See, the, the thief comes not but for, to steal to kill and destroy. And the enemy here is trying to kill, steal, and destroy Abram's blessing. He has great promises. His life is going to be shaped by these great promises. But here is the challenge. And the thing that comes bubbling up is an area of his weakness. It's called fear. And it's also selfishness. Look here. They will kill me, but they will let you live. Now, they're going to abuse you, but they'll let me live. We'll compromise you to save me. Are you with me? Please say you are my sister. That it may be well with me. Who's he thinking about here? He's thinking about his own hide. He's not thinking about what God told him. I mean... God appeared to him. He didn't just speak to him in a still, small voice. He appeared to him and told him these things. That it may be well with me for your sake and that I may live because of you. It's interesting that he wouldn't live because of God. <laughs> I'll live because of your life. Let's pause a minute and think on that. Can't live in lies, can we? Lies don't prosper. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Now, was he just going to admire her beauty? He was going to partake of her beauty he was going to either abuse her or make her a wife he treated Abram well for her sake he had sheep oxen male donkeys male and female servants female donkeys and camels I mean he he lavished uh, gifts upon Abram but listen just because you prosper 
is not a sign that all is well with you. Prosperity is not the evidence of a godly life. Now, God, God can prosper you, and it's, but just because you prosper doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing. Abram was not doing the right thing here, and yet he was prosperous. He was living in fear. He was being selfish. He was willing to, he was willing to sacrifice his wife for his own being. But the Lord. Yea, God. But the Lord. See, the, had the Lord forgotten his promise? You need to know that God has not forgotten his promise to you. He has not forgotten his promise to you. And if you've messed up, that does not disqualify you from God fixing it. He is true to his promise. And we need, well, we'll find out what Abram did here. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Evidently, Sarah fessed up. Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Everything that he had, everything that Pharaoh had given him, he said, I'm sick of you. Get out of here. Take all this stuff and go. He humiliated Abram. Huh. Let's, let's go to chapter 13, verse 1. Then Abram went up. Remember when he started from the south? He went down. Now it says that Abram went up from Egypt. I mean, he... He learned a little, well, he kind of learned a lesson here. He was humiliated. Uh, he was probably feeling very much condemned because Pharaoh condemned him pretty hard. He and his wife and all that he had in lot with him to the south. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold, and he went on his journey from the south as far as where? Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. So what did Abraham do? He went back to the house of God. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing a repentance, a work of, I mean, where he messed up, he messed up, but he had enough sense to go back to the place where he had pitched a tent and built an altar he goes back to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place of the altar which he had made there at first now look at this and there Abram called on the name of the Lord he called him by name I think that word's Jehovah or Yahweh. I mean, it's the tetragrammat in the YHWH. He called him by his name. So what are, what are we seeing here? Abraham repents, and he comes back to the Lord. And this is such a beautiful lesson for us because, listen, we have all messed up. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When you mess up, don't run from God. Run to God. Okay. Now Abraham is fixing to uh, have another step of obedience here. He see, see, he's still in partial obedience. Why? Because God said, get out of your country. He did that. Away from your family. Well, he took his dad and he took Lot. Well, dad died. God appeared to him again. And now... There's still this thing with Lot. 
Genesis 13 verse 5 tells this story. Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together. For their, possess their possession possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram is still in partial obedience. Partial obedience causes unforeseen issues. Strife over possessions, which becomes a distraction to the mission that God had given Abram. You got, you got this partnership that God didn't ordain. He was unequally yoked. Have you ever heard that before? There's people who get in relationships that they're unequally yoked in. And it leads to strife and contention and problems. Avoid those issues. It's better to obey God, be in obedience... than have to deal with these issues of strife and division. Now, here's a, here's a neat thing. Abram said, okay, he goes to Lot and said, hey, listen, we're, bro we're brethren. He's, a, he's Uncle Abram, and this is nephew Lot. He says, we can't go on like this. Let's separate. And it's interesting. Abram let Lot choose. In Egypt, he only thought about himself. He's learned a lesson. Here he allows Lot to choose. <clears throat> he said, if you go this way, you choose this way, I'll go this way. Whatever you choose, you, you choose. It's up to you. Verse 10 says, and Lot lifted his eyes. Now, notice that. He lifted his eyes and saw. Does this describe the posture of faith? He lifted up his eyes and he made a decision based on what he saw. We need to lift up our eyes and base our decisions on what God said. Lot saw Abram was going to learn to go by what God said. It's going to be, it's going to be tough. Because God is going to ask Abram to do something that he couldn't have done in Egypt because he, he, he tried to save himself. And God's going to ask him to sacrifice his son. He couldn't have done that if he'd had a son in Egypt. We're going to find that his faith grows to the point that he's able to obey God, accounting that God was able to do something. And right here... He let Lot choose. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered. See, there, it, it wasn't a famine there. Everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. In other words, he, he looked and saw this and this beauty, and it was the best side. And by what he saw, guess what he did? He chose what he saw. Is this going to cause problems for Lot later? He winds up in Sodom and Gomorrah, a place that's going to be destroyed. <clears throat> this just goes to show you, you cannot serve God and stuff. You cannot serve God and wealth, God and money, God and possessions. You can't serve both. And Lot did. And now, he was a righteous man. The Bible calls him a righteous man. And but, but when he was in Sodom, the Bible says his righteous soul was vexed every day because there was all kinds of sexual perversion going on there, all kinds of sexual stuff. Okay, now back to uh, Abram. See, he took a step of obedience there. God did a separation that brings a clarification. And any time we take a step of obedience, 
God gives us more insight. Verse 14, And the Lord said to Abram, He didn't say it before Lot left, He said it after Lot left. After Lot had separated himself, look what He said, Lift up your eyes. What did Abram say to Lot? Or what did Lot do? He lifted up his eyes and saw. God said, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all of the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. God defined one of the promises. I, I, I'm going to take you to a land that I will show you. And right here, after all of the separation that need to take, Dad had to go, Lot had to go, and now he says, now lift up your eyes. And look, north, south, east, and west, I give you all the land to you and your descendants. One had the eye, of the natural eye, Abram sees through God's eyes, through the eyes of faith. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also should be numbered. Arise and walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Now, he never inherited it personally, but his descendants did. But there is the point that it became his, as far as God was concerned. He even gave him what Lot took. It was all his. It was never Lot's. It was his. <laughs> See, God reveals more of his promises to Abraham, causing his faith to grow. Now, in the next chapter, we don't have time to get in. Well, yeah, we don't have time to get into it. But there was a, Lot goes to Sodom. Uh, Sodom comes under attack, and Lot is captured along with uh, the spoils and all of that. And word gets to Abram and he puts together an army of about 318, I think it is. And he goes after these five kings, five nations that come against Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes and he defeats them. Now he takes some, some other, Anner and some other people with him. But, but he takes and he defeats the five kings. And, he, and he, he gathers all of the spoil and all of the people. And he got his, his uh, nephew Lot. And they're going back towards Sodom. And in 1417 of Genesis, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveth. That is the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Shedolemur. And the kings who were with him. <laughs> I like saying that. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now this would be Jerusalem. Salem means peace. Jerusalem is city of peace. Brought out bread and wine. Does that sound familiar? Bread and wine. He was priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be the God, <clears throat> blessed be Abram of God Most High. Possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tithe of all. Of all of the spoils. Uh, whatever Abram had he gave him 10% of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. And basically and I'm, I'm going to I need to keep moving along. Abram says, nope, I'm not taking anything. I'm not even taking a thread. Nobody is going to say that they made Abram rich. So we see some character in Abram all of a sudden. Now let's go to chapter 15. We're going to end with this. After these things, you know, it's, it's significant that after Abram has a victory. Abram has a step of obedience after these things, the word of the Lord, imagine. See, as we are obedient to God, he reveals more and more and more to us. If God seems silent, 
maybe we need to go back and look and see where we've not been obedient to something that he said. I'm talking about in your Bible. Can we pause on that a second? Seconds up. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid. I wonder why he said that. Because Abram had been afraid. He had he'd walked in fear. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. He says, I'm going to take care of you. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Now he was asking a question. He said, God, I don't understand. How's the, How's this going to be? And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Now what if he'd given Sarah away? He tried. Thank God for God. <laughs> God, I thank you for you. Then he brought him outside and said, Now this is significant. Look up now toward heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number him. It's interesting that, that Abram was a, was a star worshiper. He worshiped the moon god. Okay? If you're able to number them. And he said, look at this. So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. Was he made righteous because he had been obedient to the Lord? No. He had been obedient and disobedient. It was a mixed deal. It's because he believed in the Lord. Listen, we are not made right with God because of what we do or don't do. You can't be good enough. You can't be good enough to have a relationship with God. It's by faith. Faith alone. Verse 7, we've got to hurry. Then he said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? This is cool. And he said, bring me th uh, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all of these to him and cut them in two pieces down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. This is a picture of what a covenant, coveting uh, ceremony is. What they would do is they would cut the animals in two, lay them here and here, and the participants in the covenant would walk between the pieces. Okay? The participants of the covenant would walk between the pieces. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, okay, then he goes and tells him about the future of his descendants, how they would be in Egypt for 400 years, and he would bring them out. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 17. Then it came to pass, when the sun went down, it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. What is that? That's God. Some people, th some theologians think that it was a theophany, which is a pre-incarnate Christ that walked between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. It was sealed by blood, by the sacrifice of animals it was sealed listen there's going to come there in the future there's going to become a greater covenant that's sealed with blood of the eternal covenant amen guess what we got to stop right there it's not the end yet we still got ways to go we're going to see abraham grow we're going to see him make mistakes but we're going to see a god of mercy and grace and love a god of covenant this is what we need to see, how God worked in his life. Because listen, he'll work in your life the same. Prayer team, come.
If you need prayer today, let's stand together. Whoa, let's stand together. If you need to make Jesus Lord, come do that today. There's a covenant for you.